The ACC announced uh, a few months ago that it's going to a 355 scheduling format uh, here in uh, the coming years, but did not specify which teams would be designated to which teams. And it's widely thought of that after Miami, Florida State being paired, that uh, another likely candidate for Miami would be old Big East uh, rival Virginia Tech, because those two teams go back about as far as anybody in the ACC going back to Big East play and uh, Virginia Tech and Miami get together on October 15th in Blacksburg. And we're doing a series in which we're bringing on media guests from some of the uh, top opponents on the schedule. We got our guy, Paul Van Wagner from ESPN Blacksburg joining us tonight. Paul, what's going on? Hey, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, glad to, I, I'm actually very excited to talk a little Miami football here. Uh, it's funny because you ask, the Virginia Tech people that played years ago, who their top three rivals are, right? And without fail, Miami appears in that group. And the the, the Hokie Nation has a uh, has a strong uh, angst, if you will, towards the Hurricane. So I, I'm very <laughs> excited about this. I think it's a I think it's a respectful feeling, you know. But like, agree, yeah, agree, yeah, yeah. Like Miami definitely is in that that tier of teams that we don't like. <laughs> oh, it was one of those uh, rivalries going back again to the Big East days where Virginia Tech was some years the only team that would give Miami a run once Frank Beamer obviously built the program to a certain level in the mid-90s and then going forward after that. Uh, so, Paul, uh, new coach, Justin Fuente, of yeah. course, shown the door. Brent Pry comes in from Penn State. Uh, give us a feel for Virginia Tech football. You give me a feel and then we'll both know. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because Brent Pry is saying all the right things, right? You know, he comes in. We're going to recruit within a six-hour geographic region. Obviously, I hate to do this to the Miami people. We're still coming down to Florida, though. That's You can't not, right? Like, that's a hotbed of talent. you you got to come to Florida. But they're going to recruit a geographic region within six hours of Blacksburg. So you're talking, obviously, Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Maryland, Pennsylvania, which was is Brent Pry's backyard, being the former DC at Penn State, those are going to be kind of their their target areas. Um, we're not going to see any more Texas to VT bull crap. I'm glad I can finally say what I really think about that. Uh, so we're not we're not going to see that anymore. Um, you know, again, saying all the right things, doing all the right things, being in places where he's supposed to be. Um, you know, showing up to Virginia Tech events. Virginia Tech just hosted a super regional in both softball and baseball. Brent Pry was at those games. You know, I mean, it's those little things that Justin Fuente never did. And and I'm not here to talk talk bad about Justin Fuente, but when kind of the rubber hit the road, he sort of disappeared. You didn't see Justin Fuente out and about doing different things around Virginia Tech. Now, obviously, Brent Pry has got that new coach smell about him. So, you know, that shine may wear off quick. I don't know. But uh, as far as X's and O's go, I don't even know who our starting quarterback is going to be at this point, gentlemen. Hmm. <laughs> Would you say this, uh, Paul, that um, Virginia Tech, of course, under Frank Beamer, lived in the top 10 to 15 in the country. Justin Fuente had a nice two to two and a half years to start, and then things deteriorated after that. That this is possibly the worst Virginia Tech roster going back to the early to mid-90s? Um, I think so. Maybe. Here's the thing. The ones are going to be competitive. When, not if, because everyone in college football has injuries, when Virginia Tech starts to have injuries, the question becomes, what do the twos look like, right? And heaven forbid if we get to the threes. If we get to the threes, guys, let's grab our let's grab our Chicago maroon and burnt orange jerseys because we might be able to suit up for Virginia Tech. The three of us can play for Virginia Tech if we get to the threes. So heaven forbid if that happens. Um, we have Miami, what is it week five? I think we'll still be healthy or should be pretty healthy around then. So if we play Miami in week eight, forget about it. Um, so, you know, the, the ones will be okay. 
it's the question of can anyone or who steps up behind that group of 22 guys. We got a really that's good a punter. Good <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good point, man. Um, when it comes to, to football at this level, a lot, a lot of people just look at it and it's, you know, it's, it's the magazine season and they want to see who's the big face of the program and offense and defense. But those of us who have played it or are or, or deeply invested in it understand that it ain't about the 22. It's about the 33. It's about the 44. And some of these elite teams go as deep as 55, yeah. meaning guys that can not just number 55, but as far yeah. as on both sides of the line of scrimmage and both sides of the ball that can not only contribute, but can start for us. Okay, that's why you call the 1%, the 1%, because Alabama's third stream middle linebacker could come start for both of our teams. Okay, that's just how it is the higher you go uh, yeah. uh, in, in the upper echelon of, of college football. So when you're building a program and you're kind of starting on that all over again, that's why you talk about giving a, a, a coach two or three years is not only to build up and get his starters up, it's being able to see the kind of quality – backups he can bring in, the kind of quality uh, uh, competition he can create because practice is where a lot of that stuff is built. When you look at programs in the DMV area where football is big, okay, mm -hmm. now you say DM3, that's three different states and like eight counties and it's pretty yep. big, but you, you want to be able to draw eyes that, that way. You guys have one of the absolute best environments for uh, a home game. We liked it from afar when other teams are playing there, but uh, it, it's gone Miami's way. And it's also turned out in 2016 where we give up eight sacks and we look like we shouldn't be there. And did we play ball today? And, and, and the rivalry, I think is something that should definitely be there because these two teams helped each other grow and, and competing in the late nineties, early 2000s, all the way up until this very, very day and helping mm -hmm. each program uh, kind of rise up to the top. So I would love for, and, and Mark remembers when I talked about my the three people I wanted to continuously play, I wanted Clemson, I wanted Tallahassee, and I want Virginia Tech. I want those mm -hmm. three teams in there because I love to use that in the recruiting prowess. So, hey, you get to play at Blacksburg, and it may be a Thursday nighter. It may be yeah. a Saturday night ABC. You know, you never get a chance where we are going to be focused in and all of college football is watching Miami play Virginia Tech. Now, if we want to get into where Virginia Tech is right now, probably a down program, but I, I really like the coach. I love the coach hire. Love, yeah. love, love the coach hire. I think he'll be good. Um, you know, I, I agree. We got to give him some time. We can't, mm -hmm. We, you know, Justin Fuente had a 10-win season in his first year and everyone was like, oh, let's see, let, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 9, 7, 6. We lose to Maryland in the bowl game last year that we probably shouldn't have even been in. And in all reality, like, you know, I saw somebody post something about that earlier across the bottom. Like, you didn't play Virginia Tech. You played against the Blacksburg High School B team. Like, that wasn't that wasn't Virginia Tech that you that Maryland beat in, in that game, you know. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's going to be interesting. Um, I will tell you right now, I am not looking forward to seeing Miami in Blacksburg. I mean, I am because it's Miami, but like, as long as Miami shows up there, I don't think that there's anybody out there that realistically doesn't think that they should truck Virginia Tech just because they have more talent. I mean, that's, you know, I know we don't play the game on paper, but you take a look at that Miami roster and that's, that's loaded, man. I'll, I'll take your twos if you don't want them. <laughs> no, we're going to hold on to our guys, man. We, we want them to be here. We want them to develop. And, and, and that's the thing. Uh, I have had some conversations um, with the former player from Botex. So I, I got a little bit of an insight. Oh, like don't call it that. Now you're just being mean. Don't call it I'm that. I'm just saying. He doesn't play don't there call, anymore. Don't call it Vatek. That's, that's, that you find yourself in a fight at top of the stairs if you start calling it Vatek. Really? That's you guys that. don't like that? Oh, oh yeah, no, seriously. Seriously, that's yeah. Um if and in fact, if you I'll send you it's make sure Mark, make sure I got his email. I'll send you a copy of our media guide. No joke, in our media guide at like one of the first paragraphs that they give out to like the the announcers from any other school or from ESPN or whatever is things not to call Virginia Tech. 
and Vatek is like the for oh yeah 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 you want to you want to make friends in Blacksburg walk around going man Vatek is fan oh yeah Virginia Tech University is another one you add university to the back of it oh man oh so yeah just, yeah you just say the whole thing or just say VT just VT or Virginia Tech um yeah either either one of those is good yeah but yeah oh yeah va tech will get people all sorts of riled up i didn't know that either so i moved here in 2016 and i made the mistake on my show of calling it that because i thought like everyone else yeah i mean it's you know it just flows. But, oh, yeah. It flows yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah but yeah. their argument is you don't call georgia tech ga tech so why are you calling us va tech okay i can take that i can yeah yeah i've never heard god okay. in my life you're right that's the easy way to shorten it though because va is obviously the that's the abbreviated yeah. version of virginia yeah yeah so it leads well, you I mean, right into biotech sure sure yep and then it leads you right into a fight in downtown blacksburg okay. i'm just all right. i'm just i'm looking out for my friends that's all i'm doing i'm looking out for my friends <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm okay. keeping you guys from getting beer bottles thrown at well, you. That's all I'm doing here. I, I, okay. I think uh, you're looking out a little bit more for me than the wholesome one because he could probably, <laughs> I know that he could handle That's himself fair. much fair. better than I could. So um, I'll Please. ask you this. And if the wholesome one has anything else, I'll, I'll leave us with this. Um, so wholesome one, certainly chime in after this. If you've got anything else for Paul and everybody, it's Paul Van Wagner from, uh, uh, ESPN Blacksburg. So since there is a rebuild here at Virginia Tech and Brent Pry does have some honeymoon period to work with, what's what's a successful season look like? So we had this conversation yesterday on the drive and success is going to be six wins in a bowl game. Um, if you look at the schedule and you look at on paper, and again, we're talking about a completely healthy Virginia Tech squad, there are eight games on the schedule where Virginia Tech is arguably the more talented team top to bottom than their opponents. By the way, Miami's not one of those one of those teams when we when we look at that. But um, so you know, we said we were talking yesterday and I said, look, if Virginia Tech wins four games, I'm not going to be surprised if they win eight games, I'll be happy, but I also won't be surprised. I think six, maybe seven, you might be able to steal like a North Carolina or a pit or something like that, you know, um, that would get you to eight. But I, I think six or seven is probably any, anything more than that. And it's like, okay, we maybe need to build a, a statue for Brent Pry. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm really big on I'm a defensive guy, so that's the sure. reason why I've known about Ben Pry for a while now. Studied some yeah. of his some of his tough and some of his tape. What I am a little nervous about is him transitioning your defense to a 34, which is what he's normally mm -hmm. used to. Um, mm -hmm. because the Virginia Tech natural defense was similar to either the 425 or an attack 43. Uh, where right. you was like filling the NFL with these defensive backs because they were playing in space, some press man, some cover three, funneling people into holes and hitting their their you know nickel and stride pick six. Mm -hmm. But one thing about what he's going to bring is a sense of toughness. Now mm -hmm. we can ask, is this going to turn into him playing great defense and then transitioning the offense to just dive, dive, slant, dive, dive, <laughs> play action? and try to really bring the Big Ten ball down there to Blacksburg mm -hmm. where, you know, it's black and blue football and we're hitting mm -hmm. you in the mouth. And if you come here and you want to do that spread stuff, you might get us. But if you come here and you try to establish the run and we're stopping the run, it's just going to end up being a uh, 2006, 15 to 12 kind of back and forth game. Right. Uh, he was like that as a player, very hard-nosed, aggressive guy. And so he's going to expect that out of his players and out of his, his, his leaders this year uh, again statistically and strategically as far as scheme wise great fit amazing mm -hmm. fit depending on what's going to happen out of that offense is where i kind of have my questions about where virginia tech is going to go this season but uh by week nine week ten i won't be worried about his defense those yeah. guys will be coached up well and they will be mm -hmm. playing hard football may not be talented but they'll be there <laughs> 
it it looks like he's going to start with a 4-3 kind of a base defense just because of the personnel that he's Correct. he's inherited um you know i i had a chance to watch one spring practice for probably about uh, an hour or so and that seemed to be most of the scheme that they were running they had the the front seven kind of working doing some stuff and then they had the dbs working with the offense doing some seven on seven kind of things um but it looked like they still had four guys in front with their hand in the dirt and then three guys up so um i think at some point you'll probably see him transition into something that he's more comfortable with he even said in his introductory press conference that you know he's going to have a real hard time giving up the play calling on the defensive side of the ball so we'll see he's you know yeah, yeah, while. yeah, that's exactly it. So um, he does have some talent on that defensive side of the ball. I mean, Dax Hollifield is a thumper. I, I wish I wish he was either two inches taller or two inches wider because I think he could play at the next level. Um, he's just he's a downhill kind of he he reminds me a little bit of Chris Spielman. Um, you know, back in the day, like he's just, he's going to, he's going to come at you and he's going to hit you and he's going to try to hit you as hard as he possibly can. And, uh, but he's, he's maybe a little bit undersized. He doesn't cover well. Um, so, you know, they, they have to kind of disguise or, or help him in, in that area. So it'll be interesting to see if Dax is able to take that step forward. Defensive back wise, that DB room is still deep. I mean, it's still really good. Like you got guys that you got guys that keep showing up in bowl games and, you know, cause, cause they're being forced into playing and you kind of wonder like, why aren't these guys playing, you know, on a, on a regular, on a more regular basis, but they they just they're kind of buried in the depth Sounds chart. Sounds like us under Manny Diaz. Why is yeah. the other guys playing? <laughs> that's, that's exactly it. D line is a big question. Um, you know, Bud Foster and his scheme forever had kind of those smaller D linemen, the twitchy guys, and right. you know he yeah they might have got manhandled up front, but you know like Taiwan Garbutt is a perfect example, right? He's six one playing defensive end. Now he's got a motor that doesn't quit. Like you, you aren't going to block Taiwan Garbutt out of the play, but you know, your defensive ends probably need to be six, three, six, four, you know, not six, one. And so he's just a little bit undersized, but you know, they do have those guys that are just, they, they have motors. They're, they're, they're motor and energy guys. And, and it's going to be fun to watch them in this Brent price system, kind of see how they, how they show up and, and how they play. I agree. One of the other things that I love about what he's going to do in his front seven, he's probably going to have those guys in the back four play a lot more of the zone and back off. Mm -hmm. He's going to be extremely aggressive in the front with your slants and your twists and your, your tech stunts and things of that nature. He's really known for that in his Penn State film and filling the NFL with linebackers because mm -hmm. of how he allows them to play so free and roam uh, and, and be able to have you know, the whole D-line is slanting strong side and his linebackers are going weak. And he got the middle linebacker and the nose guard are doing twists and stunts. And he's, mm -hmm. I really love, like I said, very, very big fan of yeah. Big Pride oh, defensive yeah. scheme-wise. And I think I'm excited to see what they can do combating against a Miami team that wants to go establish that run and mm -hmm. wants to be able to build on the offensive and defensive line. I think our teams are going to need each other and the growth on both sides of the ball. And there may be times when we lose you all. And you got we, we beat you all by a bunch of points early on because we are a little bit more talented right now. Yep. But he's going to have players that are going to have that high play recognition, high awareness. You're not going to be able to beat them with the same kind of stuff. And and I'm really – I'm a little bit more high on, on, on that higher than a lot of people because I've done my research. Now, again, that's him as a defensive coordinator. I don't know about him as a head coach. No one knows about him as a head coach. First time. All right. Now, being able to transition that into kind of feeding that into a team, depending on your personality, it can take a while to do that. It can take a while to, to have the team that runs out to uh, enter the Sandman be a, 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 a pride team where everything from the puncher to the starting quarterback, you feel his energy, you know, uh, coming out in the way that they play. In, in the way that they, you know, represent, you know, Virginia Tech. So yeah. I'm, I'm wishing you all the best of luck, and I'm hoping that the, the teams can really help each other because I think we need each other moving forward.
I agree. I mean, I think a strong ACC, obviously you got to have Clemson, you got to have Florida State. Am I allowed to say Florida State here in this? In this, We say Tallahassee. Tallahassee. I was going to say, I noticed you said Tallahassee, so I didn't One know. One of okay. us says Tallahassee, yes. Yeah. And this is the Wholesome <laughs> One show, so okay. he makes the okay. rule. Okay. You know, I, I think Clemson, Tallahassee, Miami, Virginia Tech, like those teams have got to be strong, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and then, and, then, and then what you need is you need, you know – maybe North Carolina to kind of take that next step forward. I mean, you talk about a team that's got a lot of talent, but Jesus, God, they're as soft as my beard. Um, they, they, <laughs> Not against just, us in 2020, running for 500 uh, yards on the ground. <laughs> well, that was an enigma because that is a that is a program that, like, top to bottom, it's four- and five-star kids. And, man, like, you come out – like, that's the thing. Like, okay, here you go, Miami. Here's Here's the key. Come out and punch them in the mouth in the first series and watch them go away. That's what they do. That's like, and that comes, you know, that's just, they're just not tough, but they need to be tough because you need a team. You need somebody from North Carolina. It sure as hell isn't going to be Duke. So you need either NC State, Wake Forest, or North Carolina to actually be good. And then you need the teams to pop up every couple of years in order for the ACC to be relevant, right? One year it can be Boston College. One year it can be, I'm going to do, I'm going to take your advice. One year it can be Charlottesville. Um, You know, Louisville can pop up every now and again. You know what I'm saying? Like, so you just, that, but you need that core. You need Virginia Tech. You need Miami. You need Tallahassee. You need Clemson. And you need one team from North Carolina that every year people look at them and go, we don't want to play them non-conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it could be from them having this great offense or great mm-hmm. defense or they're just a team you don't want to play in. Maybe they're 9-3. and three. Maybe they're, you yep. know, 8-4. and four, But they're yep. a tough out. We need that 4th exactly. and 5th team to be yep. a tough out. Now, I'm not a big conference guy like the SEC people are where I'm just like mm-hmm. rooting for everyone in the ACC. But oh, no, coming, no, up yeah, on these, coming up on these conference uh, uh, um, sit-downs with the – with the TV and, and being able, uh, what is it called, Mark? I'm, I'm going blank on it, Mark. Just in terms TV of contracts. Yeah. 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 TV contracts. You need the U, you need VT, you need those mm-hmm. logos. You need the Clemson Paw. You need mm-hmm. UNC. You need those logos to carry some weight so that when it's time to, to come to the table and, and we, we need to be able to, to negotiate. We don't go, well, it's Clemson and a bunch of other teams that could be right. good if things work out yep. well. And, yep. and yep. on our side, on the Coastal, Pitt was good. That was nice that Pitt mm-hmm. did what they did, won the conference, um, went and played Michigan State in the big bowl game to, to, to show people that there is and can be other teams in the ACC mm-hmm. outside of Clemson and maybe Miami when we wake up or maybe Tallahassee if they ever get the head coach right that can really present a good team and compete uh, in the big bowl games. I mean, what are we, four or five years away removed where we had the highest post postseason uh, win percentage? Well, like mm-hmm. I think six or seven of our teams won the bowl games. Mm-hmm. So we're not too far away from removed from it. Now, again, right. a bunch of us in the ACC have brand new coaches. So I don't expect everything to go like this. Yeah. But – I give it a couple of years. We got to compete, man. Not saying we got to yeah. be the, the SEC. We won't be. We, we just don't. Right. We won't be that. There's no yeah. way you're going to get that. We won't have the money. We don't have the amount of public schools and 10-year pedigree. We won't be that. But we can work to be in the – compete against the Big Ten. We can work to well, – we, well, to me, we're better than the Pac-12. So that's the yeah. team I, place I would aim to compete against is the Big Ten. Yeah. And of course, you just like they have Ohio State and they have two or three other teams that are tough outs. Mm-hmm. We got to have Clemson and three or four other teams that are yep. tough outs and, and, and can draw eyes to the TV school. I agree. I agree 100 percent. Excellent stuff. Well, Miami took them down 30-26 last year. The last trip to Blacksburg was a 25-24 nail biter for the Canes two years ago. Uh, I remember that one well. Paul Van Wagner joining us from ESPN Blacksburg. And, uh, Paul, we always appreciate uh, your time and good to see you. You guys, too. Thank you very much for having me on. I do have to ask one question. I, I've been I've been debating since I've been on. Uh, I, yes, this I, is all my hair. This is all yeah. my hair. <laughs> no, I, 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 I need to ask. I, I, I need to ask. 
and I, I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this because I don't want to. I don't want to offend anyone here. Uh -oh. Why? Why is it? Why is it that sometimes you show up to Hard Rock Stadium and there's 60,000, 80,000 people there and it's rocking? And sometimes you show up to Hard Rock Stadium and a lot of people are dressed as Miami Dolphin blue chairs. What what is it with the culture of Miami? Is it just Miami and the fact that there's so much other stuff going on every every single night that people have options? Because that blows my mind how how we can roll into to Miami and play in front of a like half empty stadium. Man, uh, they're probably. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to bring this up, but I just I gotta know. They're they're it's they're legit. striking up their their uh their pitchforks and they're coming to Blacksburg and they're looking for it. <laughs> okay, because because one thing about this fan base is they do not like being called out, and and it, and it's a fact. There were times where you look at the two year difference from when we played you all in 2017, we had 95 percent capacity because the very next week we were sold out. At yeah. over yeah. 80,000 people for Notre Dame. But the week before, yeah. we pulled out the All Blacks, and it was a great compliment. Great game. Great. I love that game. Back and forth. I like to watch it back. It was, it was a really good game. It was filled to the Raptors, you know. Yes. At Miami. So that was what, 2017. Then you come back in 2019, and it's about 30,000 people. You show up <laughs> in 2021, and it's about 13,000 people. Okay. <laughs> It was our second lowest. Our first lowest was 11,000 people on a Thursday night game on Howard Schnellenberger night against Virginia. We had 11,000 people in the stands. And, and I just okay. don't I, – I, 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 I'm sorry. I can't wrap my head around that. Why? That, that's my Manny question. Diaz. Manny Diaz. Okay. 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 Well, okay. One thing about, about Miami, and it's not a University of Miami thing. It's, the, it's a city thing. We support winners, okay? Even the, the old Orange Bowl, people like to use the adage, well, the Orange Bowl didn't have, it wasn't filled out every week. Yeah, okay. We're not Nebraska where you're going to be there every single day. But right, in the big right. games, the Orange Bowl was completely packed. Well, there's yeah. times when we have big rival teams that come here and it's still not super packed. you got to right. have a quality team that is going to come out there that's going to draw the people. Something that they want to be able to give you 55 65 dollars for a nosebleed and you're mm -hmm. going to give them back a product that they can be proud of to be out there on that football field and, and root on hard okay even towards right. the end of of mark rick's tenure we still had people there why because they respected yeah. mark rick and they were solid teams they weren't pathetic teams but the last three seasons the home games have been iffy because we don't know which kind of miami hurricanes team is going to run out of that tunnel we don't know if they're going to be well disciplined. If they right. know how to communicate and coverage, you gotta have a winning program. Look at the Miami Heat; it's empty if they are not there. Look at right after yeah. LeBron James and left; it was pretty empty. And right, they right, right. The seasons. Miami Dolphins; they don't have as many people there. Sometimes there's more Cowboys fans there when they play the Cowboys than there are Dolphins fans. It's what happens when you're in those big, those big pro cities. Okay, yeah. those bigger cities where there's more to have. You have to be an attraction that draws people in. Now, of course, we want to have more than that. We want to do better than that. We want to create a culture where people are there and supporting these young men through the tough times and the great big times yeah. where we're jumping up and down and super happy. But we, we, we have to, we have to uh, acknowledge the fact that if it is not a good product, People of Miami, irregardless of whether it's orange and green, red and black, teal and orange, if it is not a good product, they will not be there. See, I thought maybe there was a Pitbull concert or something that everyone was attending. That's Yes, every Saturday in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, look, so here's the deal. Like in Blacksburg, and I love Blacksburg. This isn't me bad mouth in my town. I love Blacksburg. But there is nothing else to do outside of – Nebraska is the same way, right? You mentioned Nebraska. I have a really good friend, somebody that used to work with me at the radio station that went to Nebraska and is doing TV there. 
They they put a hundred thousand people in that stadium every Saturday, whether they're good or bad. But what else do you have to do? You can't watch corn grow three hundred and sixty five days a year. Now, granted, we're not growing corn in Blacksburg, but I mean, like there, I just there's so much more to do in Miami, and I was just wondering if that was the situation or, or what the 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 winning. The winning product, though, makes a lot of sense to me. That I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate just slightly here with one point about that. Right. And then I'm also going to add a point to what uh, the wholesome one said about uh, 2017 and Mark Richt. My my one counterpoint to that, to play devil's advocate against the, the, the likes of Miami and, let's say, USC would be, yes, there's so much more to do, but the population is also so massive. You're drawing from a metro area of how many million people versus how many people are you drawing from from the Blacksburg metro area? Ooh, I mean, man. We got we got like we got like 180,000 people in the New River Valley. I think you have neighborhoods in Miami that have that many. You're drawing from so many more people too. Yeah. 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 The other point I, I would mean, say I, I guess- Okay, oh, Mark. Go ahead. I was just going to say, wholesome one, when you were talking about when um, you know that two game run uh, in route to ten and zero in twenty seventeen, uh, Virginia Tech Notre Dame Hard Rock was rocking. We hadn't seen that in in a few years. Uh, that uh, you said that they you know respected Mark Rick. That uh, the team was obviously good, um, but I I think it was also that there was hope that the team was going to be great. Like people thought this was the beginning of something big. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and not only that, there's a buy-in. And like you said, it was a build-up because if you go back the year before, 2016, we had some of those attendance problems. Why? Because it was such an up and down. You win five games, you lost four. You win four more games, you go into the bowl game when you're fifth one. Like that's how it was. And so towards the end of the 2016 season, when we were winning games, more and more people showed up. We played Pitt to end the season, and it was the highest rated amount of people there besides the Tallahassee game, which is almost sold out Mm -hmm. anytime they come in because it's, you know, it's Tallahassee. And a bunch of their graduates don't want to live in Tallahassee. They come Mm -hmm. down to Broward or Dade or Palm Beach and live their life with their trash degree. And they, uh, you know, (laughs) scrape some money together and get some get some tickets. So Paul, we do a Miami show on Wednesday and Thursday night. And it's a wholesome one. We got to Cam Underwood. And it is, it is, I don't want to say nonstop, but at any opportunity to cut on FSU or yeah. Uh, yeah. the University of Florida, it's, it's, yeah. They, they, and here's the thing. So Cam's big gripe is Florida. Yeah. He can't, okay. He, he, that's where he goes, Ham. So we, you know, he goes on Wednesdays. I'm on Thursdays. So I get the jab on the Tallahassee folks. He gets to jab on the folks from the University of Florida. Yeah. See, I don't mind saying University of Florida, Florida State. I, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I look, I can get behind this. So I'll, I'll share a quick story with you guys because I, I, but I, I've been doing my show for just over six and a half years, and somewhere in the first year, someone from Tallahassee found my show online, and they actually happened to find my show online one day when I was bagging on. FSU and and the culture and and some issues that they had and they took serious exception to that and they spent the next probably month just tweeting inflammatory things at me and uh so I can I can 100% get behind the dislike for that school in the panhandle of Florida I I'm with you a thousand percent I have never had a problem with Virginia Tech and I will now refer to them as Virginia Tech with no problem. I have no issue with Virginia Tech, uh, but I have lots and lots of issues with uh, Tallahassee. That's fair. That's fair. No I can get it. behind that. <laughs> yeah. We do a <clears throat> seminal show before our Miami show on Wednesday night. They go, they run back to back, Paul. So it's quite the okay. Crowd overlap. They the Miami oh. fans show up early and attack the Florida State show, and then the FSU fans sometimes hang out and jump on the Miami show. It's fun. It's all it's all good for college football talk. It it's is. good for me. It's good for what we do. I mean, you, for, for what you do, of course, Mark. Yeah, you lean into it. You like it. I mean, it, it, it's you you bring those people on, and you want to do combo shows and post game shows. Listen, I love you, Mark. 
but I will never grace the screen with someone that wears that polo. I, I just won't. I'm sorry. That's fair. I, I won't that. They won't care. That's fine. I don't care. And I will thank them for to the end of time for fourth and 14 because they got the win that sent the dude that graduated from their school and came to coach our program packing up to Penn State to try to live up to what Coach Pride did up there, which he will not, and he will be fired in two years. Okay, so keep that in mind. Thank you so much, Tallahassee people. We appreciate you down in, uh, in Core Kings. Good stuff. <laughs> Paul, we appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I'd, I'd be happy to come back anytime. Uh, I, I'm just glad I got the uh, I got the stadium thing answered. That's been that's that's been gnawing at me for a while. So I, I'm glad I could ask. And like I said, I wanted to do it in a respectful way. I didn't I didn't want to come at the Miami faithful. And it's not me coming at the Miami faithful. I got respect for all of you. So it's all good. Well, Absolutely. I will say this, and I've said this many times, and the wholesome one has been here for many of the times I've said this. I come on here as being Mr. Impartial. That's that's at least my goal is to be unbiased and impartial. I host 10 of these different shows for 10 different teams. But the Miami fan base supports me unlike any other fan base. They support this channel and my individual work more than any other fan base by far. Well, that's, that's one thing about us in, in, in Dade and Broward County, man. If we love you, we love you, and we're going to support you. If we dislike you, we don't like anything you do. And that's why we do those people, you know, the way that we do, man. But uh, I definitely would love to get this going closer to that game in week of. I would love for both of us to to sit and, and prep for that game. Hopefully Miami is on this big undefeated streak, and we're rolling, and we're in the top ten. <laughs> we got to go to Black Oh man, it, it's there's times where Miami has been just so good, and they've walked into Blacksburg, and they just can't win. It's a tough environment, man. So, it, it is. It's it's a different animal, you know. And it's only it's funny because it's only fifty six thousand people, but it's fifty six thousand really? people jammed right on. Yeah, that's it. Lane Stadium holds fifty six thousand. That's it. It's a small stadium. But they are jammed right on top of you. You got the students on one end zone. You've got the core of cadets on the other, and you got. And then the other thing that they do too, if you ever, if you ever get a chance to look, um, if you're ever in Blacksburg, take a look at what they do to the opposing team, right? So they they stick their fans on the east end stands, which is the which is the visitor side of the field. But they stick them up in the top corner, so like you can't. You even if the even if you sell every one of your tickets, you still can't hear everyone because you're so far away, and then you're surrounded on all areas by Virginia Tech people. So, like, it's just Ho Hokey Nation does a really good job of of kind of isolating the opposing fan base. Now, you'll see a smattering of Miami people that got their tickets on StubHub, but like for the most part, they're they're stuck up in a corner, and you can't. And and you just can't uh, you, you just you can't hear them, and it doesn't matter who it is. Notre Dame brought people, and and you couldn't hear them at, for the first half of the game. So, yeah, I, I, we could do this all day. I have so many questions about Virginia Tech and their home field advantage, and do you really think that that does something too? Because I mean, when they do like ten minutes early before kickoff, and the commentators don't even talk, all they yeah. do is everyone checks up. And they just bring the cameras down, turn the sound on on the cameras, and you just see the the cheerleaders do the let's go, and then they put it down, yep. and then the other big swole guy puts up the hokies, and and you yep. hear the the inner Sandman low, and it just starts to rise, rise, and then you see the team walk, and, and, and man, I love watching them. you guys upset upset Ohio State like ten years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I was in my college dorm at that time, calling bananas. You know, we, we don't yeah. root for uh, Ohio State at all in Dade County either. That's one of the other teams that we hope loses every game. I, I'm, but a, I'm, really a Michigan, I'm a Michigan fan by birth, so I can get behind that. So, Oh, man, we're going to get along really good. I like it. Oh, yeah, I know it. I know it. I've gotten some text messages Here, from Paul here, wearing here's a the, ugly here, maize and blue. Yeah. Here's here's the blanket that's underneath me right now. Like, that's that, – that's a – here, Mark, just for you, I'll do the rest of the show like this. Is that? <laughs> I love it. 
I you know, Paul, love it. I, I, I never cut anyone off and just cut you off the show, but this may be <laughs> you to be a first without any. <laughs> I'm a trailblazer. <laughs> I'm a trailblazer. Oh, one scoop, man. John loves it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. What one scoop, John came at me earlier. He's the one that came at me with the uh, with the uh, Maryland thing. You again, John. You played. Like that was a JV high school team that Maryland beat. That wasn't, and Maryland, for the record, rolled out pretty much most of their A team. So, well, you that, know, I enjoyed that personally, Paul, just because of uh, an exchange that Paul and I had about five or six weeks earlier, and where I I came to the defense of Maryland when Paul was just like he was trash. just grabbing the dregs of power five football and he grabbed up Maryland along with some others. And I'm like, <laughs> Maryland, really? They're not that bad. Come on. Come on. They're, they're a third tier big 10 team. Don't give me that. Well, yeah, they're a Do third you want tier. Them back big the ACC? Team. Um, yes. From a geographic standpoint and from a market standpoint, I would say yes. The, the, so here's here. So okay, um, here's an interesting conversation. West Virginia wants back into the ACC. You can't just bring back in West Virginia, even if you go to the three three five technique, because you need to have that even number of teams. So who becomes that other team? Um, you know, Maryland obviously would make sense. Even Rutgers maybe would make sense. Um, I mean, just from a geographic standpoint, yeah, I, I would take them if it meant that we could get I would love I would love to have West Virginia back in because I mean you have the West Virginia pit, you have the West Virginia, Virginia Tech rivalry. Um and I mean West Virginia does bring something to the table on the football field. So um yes, to answer your question, I would take them back if it meant we could get West Virginia along with them. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, me and Mark have this conversation at least every offseason because I'm big in the college football realignment mm -hmm. and FCS programs moving up to the Division One level. Mm -hmm. People know why mm -hmm. I'm doing that. You know, I'm a big, big FCS guy. But uh, yep. <laughs> when it comes to, to teams, I just never understood why Maryland would be there or even Rutgers. Because I mean, like, yeah, New Jersey, but they would make more sense in the ACC, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's teams like I want Notre Dame. Yeah, I want Notre Dame in, but I want them in the Atlantic. But we're getting rid of that, so it doesn't even. Yeah, matter. we're getting rid of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want Notre Dame and I want uh, West Virginia. I think those yep. two teams historically have really good rivals. I mean, Notre Dame, all their rivals are in the Big Ten, but I think right. it would be real good to see that helmet. And they play an ACC schedule any mm -hmm. damn way. <laughs> I mean, right. It, right. it's weird, right. but West Virginia yeah, I, and Miami have some good history and some good games. What's anywhere in that DMB, they, they have rivals in there. A majority of the DMB yeah. people are in the ACC, so I think it would make sense. Yeah. I think that, you know, I, I agree. I would love to see Notre Dame. I just don't. The reason I don't mention them is because I don't see any way that they get rid of their television deal, and I don't see any way that the ACC lets them in unless they do or they do some sort of revenue share. So I just, I, I mean, it sucks from an ACC standpoint, but from Notre Dame standpoint, like I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. So that unfortunately, you know, I, I don't think that that's going to happen. And Charles brings up a good point too. I mean, Notre Dame probably does technically belong in the big 10 just because of geography. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then again, Rutgers and Maryland don't belong in the big 10 for that same argument. So. I mean, yeah. uh, we, we need well, someone to uh, give the uh, tic tac to Ohio. Worn out, uh, approach and philosophy by the big 10 grabbing cable markets in new york mm -hmm. washington dc and uh baltimore when you know within a few years it's like okay we're in the digital age and cable tv is still a factor a huge factor but it's drying up as opposed to yeah i'm a big proponent for notre dame not only from a geographic standpoint but just historically Michigan, Michigan State, Purdue, those are long-standing rivalries that they played every year for decades and decades and decades. And it just, Notre Dame just has a feel that fits the Big Ten, just a football program feel in history that is just ingrained in the Big Ten. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. All right. Speaking of which, I'm running off to a Penn State record. Oh. Oh, man. Hey, hey tell, tell, them, tell them thank you. Um, and I'm so sorry. Tell them I'm, I'm sorry for what they're going to experience defensively. 
it feels good and sounds good at first. And then halfway through the season, when everything is figured out, it will go right down into shambles. I'm sorry. And tell them we said thank you and we appreciate them. Our most recent thank yous go out to Brett Biller. Thank you so much for the uh, contribution there, sir. And also uh, Torian Hepburn, who said, awesome show. Thank you for thank you. appreciating us, Torian. Thank you so much for that. And uh, that happens each and every Thursday because of this guy, the wholesome one. And then tonight we got uh, a dose of uh, Paul Van Wagner. And I apologize. Blacksburg. Well, <laughs> uh, you had nothing to apologize for until you look oh, at the ugly colors and put those in front of the screen. It's it's just it's my natural reaction when people tell me they listen to the show. I the first thing I do is tell them I'm sorry. So that's just you know my <laughs> show, not yours, mine, not yours. So yeah, no, that's it's a natural reaction. I uh, sorry about that. All right, guys, great <laughs> stuff. Uh, appreciate you doing what you do, Paul. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Thank you, gentlemen. Right. See you next week.